Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode unknown <laughs> of episode N, uh, Adventures in Angular, where our regular hosts are here. We've got uh, Frosty over there. Say hi. Hello. We have uh, Alyssa. Howdy. Howdy. I'm Ward Bell, and our special guest is Ben. Ben, <laughs> I see, I don't know if it's Nadal, 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 Ben Nadal. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Hey, I'm Ben. Talk to us. Tell us what your name is and um, how we're really supposed to say it. And then we're going to find out who you are, uh, what's your passion. Sure. Uh, so it's Ben, and I pronounce it Nadel, but uh, I will definitely refer to a lot of things. I believe my grandmother used to say Nadel because I think she was, I think she's from Alabama or Tennessee or something. She had a little twang on it. Um, oh, your accents in there, yeah. her extra syllables as she <laughs> stresses them. Yeah. And uh, I guess about myself, I am a longtime fan of Angular. I've been using it since, uh, I think, 1.0.8. And I actually still do most of my work in 1.22. But that's only my work time. In my spare time, I do a a ton of work with whatever the latest Angular is. I think it's up to like 7.4.1. And then uh, I'm also the uh, co-founder of a company called Envision and a principal engineer there. Working nice. on a back end and front end stuff. Nice. How in the world can you be a principal engineer at a company and do everything else that you do? Oh my gosh. Is there two of yeah, you? A clone situation? <laughs> I've seen multiplicity, us. right? Yeah, yeah. He's not telling the whole story. <laughs> what you're not saying, Ben, is that you have one of the, the best blogs out there about oh, Thank Angular. you very much. And that, you know, you're, you're prolific. You have this style, which involves this sort of, uh, you, you know, you do these little video pieces that go with your, uh, the text so that it's easy to get two ways, uh, uh, two, two versions of the same story, uh, depending on how you want to consume it or both. And that I loved your stuff so much, I reached out and grabbed you for um, Angular documentation, uh, to which you were contributing for a while. A uh, and, uh, you're one of the go-to guys for me. And so when I heard you were on the show, I had to be here. Can well, I, thank you. That's very uh, heartwarming to hear. I'd like to mention my favorite part of your blog, which you were the last holdout on staying on JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes, right. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot you were resistant to TypeScript for <laughs> forever. Did you get it working? Like I could not well, get it working. You can. You can. You can. Do I thought it, it was totally like. Not compatible. Oh no, it's possible. You just have to basically by hand transpile what JavaScript, what TypeScript would do with the. It's really the decorators that are the issue. Yeah, yeah. You have to do all the parameters on the constructors and. Uh, yeah. So here's the part where I have to say, why is Ben here? What is Ben here to talk about? Why are we listening to you today? So I listen to a lot of podcasts, or at least I try to. You know, Dev Chat TV and and many others included. That's what I do basically anytime I'm away from the desk, I'm listening to podcasts if I can. And um, it's been interesting the last you know, year or so, and especially in the last couple of months after the various JavaScript surveys have come out. I think right npm sort of had one, and then there was the state of JS. And it's been very interesting listening to people talk about technologies that are out there and about especially how exciting people are excited people are about Vue and uh, and react and sort of sprinkled in all of that is a feels like a i don't know if it's growing or if it's just always been there and it's been wearing me down a little bit but but it's sort of a, a growing disdain for angular in general and i have a habit of choosing technologies that people grow to hate 
And it feels like uh, in what was it in one of the Batman movies, right? Was uh, Aaron Eckhart's character says, "I think like die, I mean, like die a hero, or live long enough to see yourself become the villain." And I feel that way about technology. It's like, oh, that's such you... a great analogy. I love that. that. Was... Line. Yeah, it's like you either you either switch technologies or you live long enough to see them become hated. I tend to be on that latter side. I'm a, I'm a stick to it kind of ride this one off the cliff sort of a situation. Like I still. Uh, most of my work is actually still in cold fusion, which I know gets posted a little bit on this podcast. And, uh, Way. you know, yeah. I'm still on angular. I still use sublime. I have yet to open Adam or whatever the other editors are. What? <laughs> <laughs> I just, stuff works for me. And I'm like, let me You're just like, why change that. It? Why <laughs> <change> it? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I say what, but I think there's a lot of people like Ben. And I think there are a lot of people that are like, yeah, maybe not sublime. But you know the same thing. <laughs> well, think, there's nobody about doing saying that about Sublime, but about other stuff. No, Sublime's <laughs> great. Everyone that was a big diss on Sublime, yeah. man. No, it wasn't a diss on Sublime. I mean, I'm just saying maybe not Sublime. Yeah, maybe everybody's got their thing. Maybe it's brackets. A lot of people have brackets them. IO or something. <laughs> so Ben, does it? I just want to ask a quick question while while we're on it. Does it upset you that conferences no longer talk about the things you use? I, For me, you know, I used Angular JS for a while, and once you know, Angular hit, everyone cut all the Angular JS talks. And I was like, what's fudge, man? Some people are still using it. And they're like, it's not hot anymore. So I just didn't know if that was something for you too. I think that part doesn't bother me so much. I think me in particular, because I do a, a fair amount of just independent learning. So what people are talking about doesn't bother me as much as the sort of, this is no longer a good technology perspective. And, you know, I know you guys have talked about on this podcast a number of times, the so-called dark matter developers, I think Ward always calls them, right? The, the kind of ocean of people who are not on podcasts and not at conferences who are building, you know, maybe the majority of the software out there. And, and for them, this is maybe still very relevant and very productive technology. And, and the, the thing that had put me over the edge, I think, so I, had, I wrote an article uh, called on the irrational demonization of two-way data binding in Angular. And the two-way data binding, obviously... It's a, it's a little bit of a foot gun, right? In so much as if you do it wrong, it creates a mess. But it's also, it was the moment that made Angular magical, right? You open up that input and you bind it and you echo it out in the curly braces and it just worked and it was mind blowing. And there's still so much of that functionality that's available in Angular in a very safe, encapsulated, you know, implementation details kind of way. And hearing people just time and time again talk about how two-way data binding is like the root of all evil in Angular made me, I don't know, I just had to get it off my chest. And this is, you I'm know, so I'm, glad you did. Can I just say, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They well, don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> NG model forever. And I also template-driven forms. You cannot convince me that reactive forms is anything other <laughs> than a disaster. Is it a dumpster fire? It's right there on the edge. It wants to ignite, <laughs> but it can't even ignite. It can't even ignite. It's not even yeah. good enough to ignite. It no, doesn't it have just, enough fuel on it to ignite. It, it, it just sits there and steams and exhausts. No, I, all right. So I'm taking that too far. But, but, but I know exactly what Ben's talking about. There seems to be a movement afoot to, to, to make reactive forms the thing you need to do and the way you need to do it. And, well, and, no, and goodbye, template-driven, but... I thank goodness I have conf confirmation, which is as good as the moment, that um, template-driven isn't going away. I also know that it's, it's out of favor, and for no good reason. Um, so, uh, Ben, hang in there, buddy. I'm with you. <laughs> we and the dark matter will hold on. Well, does, does I mean, this mean that promises still have hope? They have a, they have a role to play, is, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, we really needed you, Ward. We were doing the ng-conf talk selection. We had yeah. this big argument about promises. And, and it was me and Joe no against yeah. the world. We were against the world. It was the two of us versus the world. They Which have world? a role to play. You know what's crazy is just a, as an indication of how things shift, right? So back when we didn't have promises and all we had was callbacks and everyone was talking about callback hell, right? People were making like a, a street fighter images where the guy's blowing the fireball through the, the pyramid of callbacks. And then async await came and it was, it was like a breath of fresh air. Like, oh, now I can have my asynchronous code look like synchronous code. It's super easy to reason about. I can have try catches. And now people are talking about async await hell. I'm like, what? Can't you just, <laughs> just be happy for a second? Your code is easy to reason about. You know, yeah. we can make a hell out of anything. So uh, complaining about 
two-way data mining is, I think it's a, it's a weird thing to complain about because when it came around, it changed the web for the better. And there's no one that can deny that. And like, and so did jQuery, right? And no, and, and, and you can sit here and foo-foo jQuery programmers today if you want to. But when you look where jQuery came from and what, when it like came out, it was the coolest thing that ever happened to the web, arguably in its time jQuery still might be the coolest thing that ever happened to the web. Or um, in AngularJS, certainly when you look at what we were doing with Backbone, like AngularJS took your code and you could do the same thing with 80% less code. I remember converting Backbone to AngularJS and I'd take some of the functions and the rest I'd just delete. And, <laughs> and then I'd, I'd put my template in and I was done. So I could get the same amount done with like 20% less code and... It was amazing. It changed the web. Like it, it's hard to even explain how much faster I got as a programmer. And so, Aaron, you are way off on that. Like I remember doing a bunch of conference talks. You and I were actually working together at Domo at this time when we switched from Backbone to Angular. Yeah, it wasn't twenty percent less code. We were we experienced eighty percent less code. Less code. Less code. Yeah. Oh, me and you together, eighty percent yeah. less code. Eighty yeah. percent less code. And so, so I think we can say we can all agree that there were the uh, actually there was a time when Backbone was amazing. Okay. So I think what's, um, so we oh, yeah, know that this is progression so and it doesn't mean that these technologies were bad for the time. They were brilliant for the time. So w- what I'm hearing Ben say though is, would we today, given what our opportunities are today, would we use jQuery? No. Would we use Backbone? No. I think we would say, no, I wouldn't use Angular JS anymore. I would use one of the other choices. But does that mean though that our current favorite is now out. Is Angular, should Angular die? That's kind of where you were going, right, Ben? And wow. I, don't, I don't think so. So, but anyway, I didn't know, I wanted to know where you were, you know, are you really worried that it's, um, you're on, on the, you know, Razor's ride down to nothing? If enough people buy into the idea that it's a bad technology, then it becomes a bad technology de facto, right? Because people have chosen not to use it. It becomes a technology that's not worth supporting because... It doesn't have a, a long-term plan. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, here's the thing. I can think about a ton of scenarios where Angular and React and Vue are both runtime faster than AngularJS, right? But I can still think of a, t- I can think of a ton of scenarios where I would walk into a business and even if they paid me to convert it to like Angular, the new one, I would tell them it doesn't make sense to convert it unless you have some bugs. Like, if you're still making money, I don't understand why you're doing the conversion. It doesn't, like, unless there's some problems on solving. You can't SEO it. You can't service that render. Okay, fine. Let's do that. But if it works and there's no complaints and you're only upgrading for the sake of upgrading, like Fugazi, that's not even the thing, right? Some people are the snobs though. And, and, and each of us are snobs at times, right? Like I am when it comes to like RX and the promises thing with Alyssa that she's making fun of me on. But um, I don't know. I, I, I look at the people that get like, violently angry at old technologies. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? Like, it solved a huge problem. It, it did more for the web than arguably React or Angular or Vue has. Like, it was amazing two-way data binding when it came out, right? Like, it was insane. So I'm still a huge fan of it. Like, when you take into consideration when it, was, when it evolved, where it came from, and all the amazing things that have come out since then, right? We can agree with that, but there are major turning points. All right. Just like you talked about Backbone. Backbone did something. You would never tell anybody to stay with Backbone. I wouldn't tell it. You know, I look at a jQuery app and I know that that needs to be written because well, it's why? But what if it's, what it's what unmaintainable? If on it? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking about if they want to mo- modify it. Look, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll yeah, continue yeah. to run a COBOL program. And people okay, get, cool. Just make right? sure. All right. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, no biggie, right? Fortran, uh, you know, uh, Lisp, uh, you know, I'll, I, plenty of these things just working. If they're working. Uh, you, you just cross your fingers and hope nothing goes wrong and keep going. Uh, so you have to have a business reason to change it. So the question really becomes, would I write something new in it? And I don't think I'd write a new app in jQuery. I wouldn't write a new app in Angular JS because Angular is manifestly better. And there are all kinds of other business reasons why you would want to do it too. But on a pure technology plate, from an engineering perspective alone, it is better. And I can explain why it's better without us taking this time. But I cannot tell you, as I sit here today, maybe Ben, you have some insight on this. I cannot tell you that Angular is better than Vue or Vue is better than Angular or 
React is better than either of them. So the dissing of Angular that I'm hearing has not made sense to me. By the way, I'm always ready to throw the, the, my current, shoot my current one, <laughs> on the hill one, right? All right. I, you know, I have no, you know, I don't care, right? Um, it's not convincing at all. I look at React apps, I look at Vue apps, I look at Angular apps, and I see things I like and I see things I don't like, but I cannot say that this is a category difference in, in the way that I do if I look at a jQuery app or a, or a Backbone app. Well, this, so like the state of JavaScript, for instance, I did a write-up on their recent findings and it just kind of breaks my heart because it's only based on who you're serving, right? right. And so, you know, the, their conclusion was, you know, obviously React is on top and doing hot. And then they ended it with saying, of course, I'm some, like paraphrasing, but they ended it with saying something like, Will Angular ever be on top again? We doubt it, you know? And it was based on this year's and last year's, um, the last two surveys, performances of Angular. And to me, it's, it's such a small demographic that will even take your long survey. And I just, I don't know if we could ever get a survey out that would truly be fair to all the frameworks. Like, I just, <laughs> I don't know. It, then, then to go and base off, you know, how this framework's doing or how it's so, going to do, it's just... So, like, I'm agreeing with Alyssa 100% here. And my experience with some other frameworks teaches me a lot about React and Angular. And in, in a lot of ways, I can't, I can't recommend the number one framework out there. It, it gives you too much freedoms in a lot of sense. And one of the, one of the strongest things are what about Angular is that it is super prescriptive and it makes a lot of decisions for you. And, you know, I think most developers aren't qualified to make those decisions. Certainly many of us recognize that. The ones I'm worried about are the ones who are like, oh, I am qualified to make that decision. That's, that's when you're like, oh shit, let's run for the hills because that's the one who's going to put you on a framework where they can make decisions and they will, and they'll use their liberty to, to Franken, Franken framework you up a thing. And then now you, to upgrade your stuff, it's it's insane, man. You gotta hook it up to can like you a define, lightning. Rod. Can you define Franken framework? I mean, I mean everyone knew what it was. There's like heart from one thing, the arm from another, it's got stitches all over it, and you own oh. the stitches. And if the stitches ever fall apart, you gotta put it back together. And and so yeah, it's it's insane. It's what you what those other the liberty that those other frameworks give you. And and here's the thing: if you're in an organization like Facebook, changing your patterns and practices it's like an order of Congress to change it in there. Like it, it, there's like a huge committee that's like, this is how we do it. If you want to change it, you got to get it through this committee and everyone does it the same way. Okay, that works. But if you're, if you're just like every company does it different and every team and every company does it different, that, that just doesn't scale. And that's where Angular starts to shine. So I, I, can't, I can't disagree with, this, with their statement that Angular might not be back on top. It might, it might not, who could say? For them to say, I think not is silly, but I certainly can't say but I do agree that um, I, I don't know, but I certainly don't think it's going anywhere because of the insane amount of safety it provides to a business, for, to the business part of the company, not the development part, but to the business part of any organization. And either provides such a massive value. One, one thing that I just wanted to touch on, and, and this is another thing that comes up a lot on various podcasts, is this idea of, of a framework being or not being opinionated. And Angular gets painted oftentimes as being a very opinionated framework. But I think it's, in my experience, it's opinionated, to your point, for the things that are very heavy lifting. Like, you know, here's a very complicated router. Let's just give you that out of the box. Like, everybody's going to be making AJAX requests. Let's give you an HTTP client, right? Like, uh, yeah. TypeScript, let's use TypeScript because it has all the type validation. I just can't believe stuff. people write their own routers. That's crazy. They do. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then, so I look at Angular and I see, I see the kind of day to day work as being actually extremely flexible, right? I mean, mm -hmm. going back to the idea, we we can have two way data binding, we can have unidirectional data flow, we can put our templates in the same component as our classes, we can have them externally linked, we can put our styles in the same class, we can have them externally linked, we can share styles between components, mm -hmm. you know, we can use ES five if we want to. So I'm assuming people are saying this because I assume all of the other frameworks can also do these things. That's what sort of rubs me the wrong way is when I hear people talk about Angular as being very opinionated, and then I try to do stuff in other frameworks, and I'll be, you know, admittedly, I don't have a ton of experience with other frameworks, but I'll want to do something, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's not, that's not idiomatic in this framework. 
like, well, what if I want to do it this way? And you're like, well, it's, it's not really built in. You're like, all right, well, so I can, well, I have the flexibility. That's not reactive. So you can't do it. <laughs> that's what you're saying is like, you can't do it that way because it's not reactive. And you're like, well, that's not very flexible. Right. I, I, well, I, some of that, again, just could come right down to the familiarity issue, right? Like even but, when people say that's not idiomatic, you might also be very comfortable doing things that people would, if you didn't know Angular and you went and asked somebody how to do a thing in Angular, they would say, well, it's not really idiomatic to do it that way, but you're very comfortable doing it because you consider yourself to be, you know, close to, if not far beyond an expert. I don't want to uh, assume your humility levels here. <laughs> But um, talking about opinionatedness about it does have a little bit of a two-edged sword because until you become an expert in both, you probably have a little bit less ability to say what is or is not truly an opinion on this. But there's a few things like I totally get what you're saying, but I think I would challenge it at least a little bit in that Angular kind of like makes a few decisions for you. Right. And I think most people recognize that's being that doesn't necessarily mean it is more or less flexible to do things a certain way. If I want to be more reactive or less reactive, I want if I want to do, you know, this or that, it, you know, it comes right down to it. There's an infinite number of choices you can make while coding within any framework. And so, if your choices are infinite, is one framework actually really more opinionated than another? Right? That's not. It's this infinity versus that infinity. Yeah. But, and, and and I guess that's my point, though, is that I th- I view Angular as being you know somewhat opinionated in the bigger picture things and then very flexible in the day to day. The fact that people time and time again will talk about Angular as being a very opinionated framework, I think it's only negative in that it turns some people off. They're like, oh, well, that's why I don't want to use Angular. I've talked to people who are like, oh, I I changed Angular because React didn't let me do X or I like React because, you know, Angular prevents me from, you know, B and, and, or I like Vue because the other frameworks aren't good enough at, you know, C. And it's like, dude, screw you guys. I could do all that with jQuery and vanilla JS. It's not about a framework. At and this an point. Excel spreadsheet. Give that man a spreadsheet and he oh, will yeah. blow you out of the water. I will. <laughs> you don't even need an app if you give me some Excel spreadsheet. No, but um, yeah, like it's not the framework. I, we, we all did this in, in, in vanilla J- JavaScript or jQuery clear, you know, 10 years ago. So don't talk to me about the framework. Don't tell me one framework's better because you can do something that another framework can't. That's not true. You're, you just don't know how to do it in the other framework. And so, yes, it, it's so heavily based on preference that at a, at a certain point, trying to break down why one is quote unquote better is senseless because it's so heavily preference laden, the decision. And so, I mean... Are there points that aren't preference? Are there logical points of why you pick one over another? Yeah, but at the end of the day, it's very, very heavily preference-based. So I keep coming. I've been wrestling with that actually a lot lately. And one of the pillars of Angular that actually, not that I've been questioning, but I've been kind of digging deep trying to understand what it is I love about it. Um, And that's dependency injection. And, Hmm. and, And I love dependency injection. And I was actually at a meetup the other night with uh, people who do React and Vue, and they don't use dependency injection. React doesn't have it built in at all with, with mm-hmm. like some of the context API a little bit. And Vue has it as like a also has it, but not really the way we do it kind of a thing. And, I was, and people were like, oh yeah, we just don't use it and we don't miss it. And I was trying to explain what it is I like about dependency injection. And there was, it was, you know, someone challenged me like, well, do you ever actually swap out instances or implementations? And I'm like, you know, not really. But for me, the value of dependency injection is forcing me to think about the separation of concerns and how I can take something that might do four things and break it up into something that does two things and then accepts a, you know, an injectable behavior that does the other things in an encapsulated way. And if you don't have dependency injection, you're not, you're not thinking about those separation of concerns as oh, a first-class citizen. You, you are so talking like my language right now. I, I really started in C-sharp, right? And dependency injection became a very big thing. I mean, it's this concept that exists far outside of Angular and React and Vue. Some people assume it's just a testing thing, and it's really not. It's a, it's a software engineering thing. But I also think it's worth challenging the notion that software engineering can't be reliable, maintainable, et cetera, without dependency injection, 
But there is absolutely absolutely a reason that dependency injection is a very stressed and commonly done thing in .NET and Java, which arguably those two run, you know, like of the last couple of decades, those are kind of the big ones that are running most of the big code that has been built in the last couple of decades. We're making this shift over to JavaScript and stuff, but those are kind of the big gorillas on the block. And those a lot of those programmers are out there thinking, I don't know why people are arguing about this JavaScript crap. <laughs> <laughs> but so like, so I, I, for me, thing. DI is also, you know, like it's the sign, it is one of the signature feature of Angular, and I would miss it if I was asked to program in something else. I know I could. Because there was a time I wrote C Sharp without DI. And so I, I know I could do it. But you actually are using it, Ben, for, uh, or you probably are, like think HTTP interceptors. How do you do those? Right? You, got, uh, that's, you, de- you inject them. You don't replace everything. But I'll bet if you look over your code, you'll find that you've got some, some places where you're, you're digging in. Now, so and they do, as, if you're a framework author, and I, I've written a couple of them, um, it's, it's our extension model. Okay. <laughs> Now they have a plugin, you know, others have a plugin model. I don't, we have a very well-defined plugin strategy. It's called dependency injection. You just mm-hmm. read something that you're going to replace. They all have plugin models um, that are not DI based. And I'm not sure that there is a standard way to do plugins or that it has the flexibility that we have in DI. And I think that's where I would push back because like, how would you do interception in an HTTP? That I, I have no idea what they would, how they get their access tokens in, how they um, do the other kind of logging and the other kinds of things that we routinely do for HTTP interception. I think if we got concrete and had a, had a dialogue about these kinds of things, we would learn what their alternative strategies are and whether they have a consistent pattern. And I haven't done that work yet mm-hmm. um, to have that conversation. But I certainly feel the same way about you that you do. And it's one of the reasons, it was one of the things I'm pretty sure I would miss. But notice how I'm expressing that. I'm not saying that Vue is bad because it doesn't have DI or React is bad because it doesn't Vue, have Vue does DI. have some DI. I, just I, I know there's a plugin yeah. that you can do it. But, but and, and I would, I'm sure that if I went over there, I would grab it in a hurry. But it's not sort of threaded throughout, perhaps. That, you know, like in Angular, a component is built, it gets created. You use DI to create it. And I don't know how they do it in Vue if you have the DI path. The thing is, I'm sure I would learn how to do it in Vue. So I'm not saying that you can't, or React, I'm not saying that you can't get by without that feature. I'm just saying it's one of those things that I have found incredibly useful, and I would miss it. And that's, a, that's different from knocking somebody's framework. I would miss the universality of TypeScript. In Angular, anywhere I want to go, I'm talking TypeScript to people. In React, you can use TypeScript, but if you really want to know what's going on, most of the libraries and things you're going to get sample code you're going to get doesn't have it. I would miss that. Yeah. So on the other hand, I know people love that um, very easy uh, functional components. And in Angular, that ain't easy to do. Need to create a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. We target Angular 6 and the recent versions with much of the curriculum is suitable back to Angular 2. Or go beyond the three-day class with a consultation or project launch with Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. We can assist your team or launch your project with advanced Angular topics including scalability, data flow, state management, full-stack product design, and more. Contact us for a private class at your location or buy a ticket for public classes in various cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. Yeah, so dependency injection is a big one for me. And then the other one that I keep coming back to kind of as a second pillar is uh, the, the Angular router. And very specifically, the, um, I don't know what the term would be, it's like the sibling routes. Like, you know, you could have your main set of routes and then you could have a completely parallel set of routes that can be active at the same time or a third set of routes. Which, you use that, the aux routes, the auxiliary the aux, routes? Yeah, the auxiliary routes. I, I think... I think that's one of the things that actually sets the Angular router apart from, from all the other routers. Because what happens is, right, and, and, and Angular sort of gets pitched as, as being, even if it's losing ground, I think, in the sort of day-to-day development world, I think a lot of people still look at it as being a very enterprise-oriented solution. And, you know, it's almost silly that that's to some degree a diminishment because I'm sure by and far the world spends vast amount of more money on enterprise software than it does on little software. And having things like 
you know, URL driven states and applications where you can have fly out things and tab navigations and, and, you know, things that are enterprise type interfaces. I mean, that's, that's super powerful. I mean, in Angular JS, I was trying to do that kind of stuff and having to hack auxiliary routes into the query string just as like additional query params. And now it's a native, you know, embedded parameters style of state management. And that's, I don't, I don't, I don't know if any of the other routers out there have that, but I, I could be wrong. Well, it certainly does come out of the box, and and you don't have to argue with anybody about which router you're going to use in Angular. <laughs> most people, most people which, have surrendered. Which again, Angular has always been considered to be opinionated, but the last iteration of Angular, Angular JS, you did argue about which router you were going to use, right? The new new router. Well, oh no, I mean before that, thankfully. I mean, you know, there was a uh, UI router, the UI router, right, UI router right, versus the regular router. You would people would argue about it. my numbers were which are, I feel like are fairly extensive. Indicate that around fifty percent of most Angular JS apps were built with the UI router. So it wasn't like one was dominant. It yeah. became this like schism, right? It was the old hands versus the new new hotness, and I guess. But I kind of, I think it's, I, I really want to circle back around just a tiny bit to this. I think it's almost funny to have this conversation and have an episode where we talk about is Angular, you know, is it dying or something when the raw numbers, not some survey, which again, I've heard a lot of people explain why that survey is showing the things that it is. And it's like, oh, it's only their React friends because their guys are big into React. So naturally this, but you know, their response to it, I thought was relatively compelling that they did what they could. And that seems like they actually got a fairly decent sampling. But the actual raw numbers like of just, let's talk about visits to angular.io or the official documentation sites. There are far more visits today to that than there are to the old AngularJS sites. When AngularJS was, you know, 70 or 80% of the market, there are still, there are many, many, it's like several times. I think if it's close to an order of magnitude, isn't it, uh, Frosty? Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, well, board would know. Board, you you probably have the inside track on. No, that. no, actually, uh, I I've stepped back from from the documentation for well, maybe over, not today. Over, over a year, but um, yeah. but the thing is that it, it it's a pretty good indicator that people are at least writing stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because why so, why would you go to the Angular documentation unless you needed to? I don't go there because <laughs> I'm just like. You know what? I feel like a burger. I, I mean, I, hang out. I just kind of hang out over there. You just hang out over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I go to YouTube and watch a video or maybe read a random yeah. article on some random documentation on a product I don't use. So, which is really funny. And my own personal opinion is what, we're t- what we actually is, is it's all us talking heads, right? A lot of talking heads are using React. You know, you think, well, there's only like a hundred talking heads or a thousand talking heads, but their survey had what, 22,000 respondents? I think there's about 50,000, you know, talking heads and a lot of them are migrating over, you know, and people are starting to use React. And it's these, it's a lot of people that are, tend to be, like to be doing whatever is new. And uh, we'll see how, where Vue ends up falling in that. Is Vue going to start supplanting in any way? Like right now, there's very few jobs in Vue. A lot of people are interested in it. It's, it's easy to put up content about it and have people read it, but in the U.S., there's not a ton of jobs. Are, are you sure? Uh, are you, oh, oh, your uh, jobs. Okay. Jobs, I, we, yeah. we, you see on our, on, on the other podcast, the Real Talk podcast that John and I are doing, we're trying to get a lot more people from these other communities, and they are wonderful. Uh, right. They're fresh voices. And they're all like tearing their hair out with the same question. It's like, why do people think that nobody is building enterprise apps in view? And then they start ticking things off. And mm. well, why do they think that they're not? And I've had React people saying, oh, no enterprise builds anything in Angular. And I say, what bubble are you living in? There must be Angular people who are saying, nobody builds anything in React. That's clearly wrong. Uh, (laughs) You know, uh, uh, I think that based on the numbers we see, we can safely say that all of these frameworks are doing well. And um, hallelujah. You know, there's plenty for everybody to eat. Well, and and to Joe's point, I think... One of the biggest takeaways for me over the last year or so is just to not care so much. What I mean is not care so much about the technologies I'm using and not... When I was younger, and I think this is also part of being younger and new in development, you you find something that works and then you evangelize it because you're like, I went from not being able to do anything in this world to being able to have an idea and now putting it on paper and deploying oh, yeah. it somewhere. And now like that's magical and I can't believe no one else is using this or everyone should be using this. And now I'm like... Most of the time, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I can still get the business problem solved. And like, that's pretty good. 
And I, I need to adopt more of that attitude and not worry so much about trying to defend or evangelize the, the choices that I make. I got to tell you something. Pascal is freaking awesome. <laughs> That's what I learned with Pascal. I was a cute basic man myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, I built a Dungeons and Dragons assi- a master assistant program, a command line one. That's how I learned to program is because I just wanted to build something for a game. I was, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. D&D taught me to program. That's what, that's what drove me to continually try to get more stuff because I needed more features in this thing. That's dumpster diving? Is that what D&D is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dumpsters and diving, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, what, I, what do I know, you know? Hey, Ward, everybody is playing D&D nowadays. Are Just, they really? Everybody yeah, is it's doing pretty hot. Ah, there you go. I'm, I'm out of it again. Once again, <laughs> you're out of it. Too busy sharpening my pencil. <laughs> oh, you're still playing magic. That's cute. Yeah, that's cute. Playing magic, the gathering. Um, D and D guys. Oh, oh, okay. But so, so let's look at some of the, what, what should we be doing with respect to a framework that we don't know? I think ignoring it is not good. Hey, I, look a, I am oh. a big proponent of ignoring things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can ignore it, but, but I think there is benefit and value to looking at what the others do. I look at Vue, for example, and I see a lot of beautiful stuff that I would hope that our Angular people are looking at and saying, wow, we should do that. Now, what are those beautiful things? I think their um, UI over their CLI is beautiful. You know, you, you walk through that and you say, wow, we should be able to do this. The way in which even their CLI output was beautiful compared uh, to the console was beautiful compared to what we were doing in Angular. And there's uh, lots of usability features that, that they had that are just elegant. And I say, we can have these. You know, well, you know Angular can learn something from just the whole the view approach. Uh, so I've, I've been mesmerized by how well they do that. The thing that's clear in the view world is that the way a developer learns and experiences the developing in it is paramount. They care about that more than, almost more than anything else, it seems. And in Angular, I do not get that sense. I do not get the sense that, uh, and I love Angular, and you know, I'm I'm in there, but I do not get the sense that ergonomics is first, that developer learning is first, that ease of use is first. That is not a, that is not the Angular ethos, and I wish they had more of it. So I, I you know, I can look to a view and I can say, hey, Angular guys, take a, you know, take a look at that, take that. And uh, I, I would like to be able to do the same thing in React. So I've given a little teaser. Ben, you've been looking around. What do you see? What, what, what do you see that you say, wow, you know, we in Angular could really use that? Well, so I just want to back up for one second, because I think uh, just as a, as a quick aside, when I first started using Angular JS, I was ng controller all day long. And like it was all uh, controllers and link functions and I had never used, probably in the first literally two or three years of Angular development, I had never used an element directive. And uh, it was, I don't know if it was Joe, someone at one point expressed an opinion, were like, who doesn't use element directives? Like, why would you ever do anything but that? And, and, <laughs> and I'll tell you, it, it, so like even within a single framework, right, there's the perspective that you have. And in all fairness to myself, that's how the early documentation taught, right? It was all ng controller. And just by exposing yourself to other people and their approaches, you know, it doesn't have to be different frameworks. It can just be different methodologies. And that can really radically change the way you think about stuff. Like today, you know, was, even with the newer stuff that I still do in AngularJS, it's all element directives and it's completely different than the AngularJS I wrote six years ago. So again, it doesn't have to be a cross framework, but certainly a cross framework, you know, even Beyond that, I had never used React, and uh, and one of my teammates started using React internally, and seeing him use React, although I don't love React, completely again changed the way that I think about Angular and about data flow and data management, and you know that was all of the flux and the unidirectional data flow and controlled inputs and things of that nature. And I still don't again, React is not an enjoyable framework for me. Um, but now I've spent the last couple of weeks trying to dig into view a little bit and, and towards point, it's definitely does, it does seem to be very focused on ergonomics and ease of use. And, um, you know, there is definitely something to be said about that. I, I don't see it as being all that different from angular. Uh, it's just like, it's, it's almost like it's, 
I could almost see you transpiling view code into Angular code by adding some more cruft. Right? <laughs> it's just it's like Angular but without some of the cruft. <laughs> yeah. I think it's great. I mean, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge New Year's resolutions person, but 2019, my focus or my hope is to step outside of my comfort zone in terms of trying things that I'm not familiar with, which is where I got onto view in the first place. And I want to just try to build things in other technologies. My, my fear is that I will do nothing but try to port Angular mentality into mm -hmm. view applications. If you're like, how do I build this Angular app using well, Especially after apps? doing Angular for so long, right? Yeah. It's like, how, how do you even get out of that mindset? <laughs> right, exactly. I want to throw in something on that list, which is if you're looking for a, a, an item like this to go and learn and see, oh, this is something that we need, go and learn Elm and look at their compiler output. And then look at Angulars and be like, oh my gosh, how can I possibly ever survive another day with these kinds of error messages? So I, I spoke at a DevOps conference in Kansas City like a year and a half ago. And this guy after my talk came up to me and he was completely serious. And he was like, have you heard the good news? And I was like... Oh, I <laughs> I was really confused. Did he have a pamphlet, right? right? And, and I was like, the good news. He goes, yeah, the good news about Elm. And I was like, the, the tree? Like, I literally asked him if he was talking about a tree. And that was my first uh, step Excellent. into Elm. But there's some scary Elm lovers out there. Well, exactly. And, it, and haven't they heard about Dutch Elm disease that wiped out every Elm in North America? Elm, Elm is dead, man. <laughs> how, can you, how can you talk about that, Joe? I do kind of want to take a look at GraphQL. That seems to be... Mm. Oh, yeah. That's a hotness. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's a hotness. Cool. yeah, that one's, I mean, that one's not... You can't pick up every new technology, but that one is certainly jumped a shark at this point. It's interesting, though. For me, hearing people okay. talk about GraphQL, I think it, 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 it goes to show, again, how everybody's perspective is a little bit different. So right. one, one of the big selling points for GraphQL is like, oh, you don't need to talk to the back end people to make changes. Like you just change the <laughs> client side code. And for me, I'm like, but I am the back end guy. Like mm -hmm. if I need another column to be sent to the client, I just go and change it on the back end because I happen to work in a place where I happen to be both the back end and the front end on my particular team. So it's like, that's not a pain point for me. So everyone's, everyone hates on existing technologies that seem like, I, uh... isn't that just how you do it? I read an article that the guy said, I don't use Redux because I use GraphQL now. <laughs> and I was like, what's <laughs> happening? Is that Earth? that same article where the guy kind of basically makes this, I thought that was a great article. He makes this argument well, that they don't solve the same thing, but with one, it might obviate a lot of the need for the other. Is that that article, that one? Yeah, I just, I, he, he talked about the pain and like the, like the code spread that you have to get to get Redux going correctly. Mm, yeah. And he's like, and I don't have that when I when I write the code with with GraphQL, I don't have that, and I don't really need it because I could just get the data differently. And I was like, oh, that's you're talking about two distinct problems, and it, like you you solved your pain with Redux by getting rid of Redux, and <laughs> and that has nothing to do with GraphQL being awesome. Like, uh, so, so yeah, but um, anyway, yeah, I I, I hear a lot of. Things like that. GraphQL is legit, though, despite the non sequitur that that, that article led us to believe. So. I think no matter what you try in this new year, I think there's a lot. I have a lot of friends, at least, who are. I like how we're calling them big heads now. Uh, Wait, <laughs> I have a lot of friends. Talking heads? What? What? Yeah, talking heads. That was it. Okay. Sorry. I was meant. Okay, never mind. Big heads? <laughs> well, the, the two go hand in hand. <laughs> the two go hand so in hand. I have a lot of talking head friends who um, behind the scenes will like kind of whisper to me, of like, I am. I'm trying React out, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Alyssa, <laughs> like, Alyssa, so do you hear those voices now? <laughs> talking to you like right now. Are they talking to you right now? They are. They are. They're whispering. To me. Hey, I'm trying React. So I just don't think we should have to. I don't know. There's there's this idea that it is something to be shameful of um, if you're trying <laughs> different frameworks. If especially if you are a proponent for a certain framework, an advocate for a certain technology um it's almost like taboo for you to try something else out yeah i get that like i have friends who are like oh yeah i'm just working and i'm like oh cool what are you working on they'll tell me but like and i'm like i'm trying to know like 
what technology they're using. And, and they're just like, I'm purposely not talking about that. <laughs> they're trying to avoid it. They don't want to tell you. <laughs> yeah. So we end up like, like what uh, frameworks are you guys using? <laughs> Cause that's, and they're like, Oh, well, you're probably gonna be mad at me, but I'm using something else. And, and like, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't care. So there, there is some sort of, there is some sort of inherent shame when, Hey, you're, you're known for this. Other people who don't do this, don't want to tell you that they're using that instead of yes. this. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so, I've experienced that a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is that where you are? Are you you because you were starting with that or sort of I think you were actually saying things like that. Like I'm feeling a little a little worried because <laughs> uh, uh I'm hanging on clinging on to Angular and maybe I should be going somewhere else. That's a different flavor of the same thing. Are you feeling yeah. put upon? In in a very practical way, I'm feeling put upon because uh where I work at Envision. We, the, the engineering team at large has decided not to move forward with Angular for new technologies so or for new applications. So in a, in a very... Apostasy, yeah, apostasy. So I was never part of that conversation, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, so, what are know, they doing? What are they doing? They're um, uh, primarily React. Uh, there is some view I just discovered, but primarily React and... Um, Trying to think what other technologies. Can you tell us why they made that move? Was it because they didn't want to do the upgrade? I, I mean, it's, I was not involved in the conversation. So I think it was, if I had to guess, it was a combination of React as the new hotness, plus, you know, probably several key engineers saying mm -hmm. React does things that other application framework cannot do. Which, which is rubbish. Yeah, which is rubbish. <laughs> indeed. But, you know, it, it only takes a, a quiet vocal minority to make, yeah. you know, a fallacy into a fact. Mm. But um, I, I'll tell so you, it's much better. I can do so many more things with it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> right? His uh, his minority is a Valley Girl voice. <laughs> but one of the things I, I have been enjoying while learning, digging into Vue a little bit, is is finding things that work in Vue and then trying to backport them to Angular. And and I think it's actually a very interesting exploration in the so called flexibility versus opinionation of the framework because. Um, like, for example, one of the things in Vue that you can do is at the end of your click handler or your click biome, at the end of your event bindings, you can have like dot prevent or dot stop or, you know, like the same things that we do in Angular where you can have uh, key modifiers. You can, because we use dependency injection and a whole events plugin system, I can create a plugin in Angular that will create dot stop on events, you know, so I could have form submit dot stop and it'll trigger the event and then stop the propagation or prevent the default. Right. But I wonder, and I haven't dug into this, can I do the same thing in Vue? Like if I wanted to add a new event modifier in Vue, is there even a way to do that? And I don't know. But it is, it is just very interesting to see how much you can backport to Angular versus what you could backport to other frameworks. Oh, that's a good observation. It's very flexible. I'm having this sort of minor love affair or, or affair of some sort with Vue. So I'm with you. Uh, and, but that's in part because I think architecturally Vue and Angular are similar enough that there is a lot of opportunity to exchange ideas. You know, in Vue, it's very, they're very big on single file component, SFC mm -hmm. style. And I don't know whether I like that or not, but you can kind of have to it in Angular. And so you can sort of explore what that would feel like. So there's lots of, there's lots of back and forth there, there. But you're really in an interesting spot there. If your company has made the move to React, you can you can just hover over it and see how they're doing and find you know what you know. That's great. Are you, is that part of your 2019 game plan? I hope so. I mean, at work right now, my plate is full enough with all the legacy, so I'm on the legacy team essentially, more or less. Uh, I have I have plenty of work supporting uh, lovingly the thing that the users use as opposed to a all the new stuff, which is not quite there yet. I, I, I do. I certainly, I look forward to looking through the view code that the other team, we have one other team that's been writing in view and I look forward to, to kind of picking their brains. Cause that's obviously very hands-on, right? It's not just theoretical. How is it that you have in three or four frameworks in the same company producing the same product? How do you make that work? <laughs> it's a distributed systems architecture. Oh, is that what you call it? Okay. All the autonomy. Is it really the same product? It's the same ecosystem, right? But it's it's separate. It's separate individual applications that all. I, I can't talk very eloquently about it because it's not what I do on a day to day. 
I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, my husband's company has the same deal, but it's all different products. So it's just like, here's our 20 products. These are in Android. These are for iOS. These are for web. And so obviously they're in different like languages, it's, but I it's, know it's the same for you. It's, uh, I, I, I think the, the separation is more along feature sets. So, so for example, the view stuff is more the administrative features that would be internally facing and the react is going to be all of the, the user facing functionality. Okay. I want to get new perspective on everything. And then I am super, super excited for the Ivy render because to this day, I can't get my build under like 600K or something for anything. I'm excited to hear what that does because I think it's going to be pretty magical. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and then I would love to see, I've had some issues with the, the animation system in Angular is very syntactically heavy mm. <laughs> it's like i guess it's it, it's an abstraction on top of the web animations api it is yeah and uh i miss the simplicity of just adding classes at runtime to your elements that are animating mm-hmm. and, that, and that's what you yeah, can, you can but start. um if you aren't writing just for the web then the angular animations module is better yeah, the chances are that I will always be writing just for the web, or at least any particular application will very, with a high degree of likelihood, be for the web. Right. I, I very much advocate for the animations um, that are built in, but I will always be a CSS girl at heart. And if I can ever write an animation there over doing it in JavaScript, I absolutely would. So I'm, I'm with you on that. But. So Vue to me actually sort of feels like a sweet spot. So Vue takes the class base, the CSS class base animations that Angular JS had, mm-hmm. but then also now makes them data driven with hooks. Right. So in Angular JS, a big point was I sort of had to hack together events. There was, I think there was like a before event that would get fired and you just had to listen to it on the DOM, right? And, and in Vue, it's a first class citizen. Like there's actually animation hook methods that you put on your component so you can make your animations data driven. And that's like a really compelling reason for me, like, because I've never been tempted to try Vue before. But if you're telling me their, their animations are done nicely, I want to go play with that now. So I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. It's like out of the box, you get exactly what you got with AngularJS. And then you have the ability to then hook in and make them more dynamic. That's cool. I'm, you know, I'm sure I'm misstating some of these things because I'm on like day eight. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it does make me very nostalgic. All right. Should we call it a wrap? Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to talk about before we do picks? One thing that I would love to know more about or just to learn more about is the optionality of Zone.js. Um, th- I started to think about this a lot more. I don't know if this was on Adventures in Angular. There was one podcast with Ben Lesh where he started talking about, uh, I forget it was like observe, like async await something. There was something like native async await you can't tap into with Zone.js. That's correct. And that made me you can't tap into it with anything. You won't be able to debug it. And so that gave me, that actually kind of like shook me in the core. Yep. And I was like, oh, that sounds like something that most people will probably dismiss, but is actually like a dark giant that could disrupt everything. And, uh, and I do know that in theory, you can have Angular without Zone.js. And I think there's even like a no op setting you can set for Zone. I've never played with it at all, but I'd be curious to see what Angular looks like from an implementation standpoint if you choose to opt out of zones. Are you setting us up to plug ng-conf? I, uh, over to you, Joe. Is it, that sounds like a slow pitch over the plate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Ben slowly winds up. <laughs> See if Joe can hit it. Joe, can you hit this one? <laughs> uh, for people who didn't know that um, Alyssa's been helping us out with talk selection, Alyssa did help us out with talk selection. We just completed it. Now, I'm not going to say anything doing mood to picks. That's going to be my pick. So let's just... Let's just say that I'm going to talk about that in my pick. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. 
Triplebyte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash angular. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triplebyte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. All right. Well, then we're good. Let's move on to the picks. All right. I'm going to call picks first. Joe, you got some picks, bruv? All right, I got some picks. <laughs> now that I, I said I'm not going to cover it. I know. I'm like, Joe, just give us your said. pick. Gosh. <laughs> All right. For, so my first pick will be ng-conf because we're going to be talking about, there will there is, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is there two talks on that topic plus whatever the Angular team comes up with? I know there's at least one top on that topic. There might be two plus whatever the Angular team comes up, which is like, you know, a significant percentage of content. I'm sure the Angular team will also talk about it quite a bit. But we have community talks already talking about zone and the optionality of zone and what things will look like. Is that Maxim's? No, Max, is, is Maxim's talk about that? Uh, I can't remember. Can't remember. They, they, they become a blur. Anyway, um, yeah. awesome looking talks about that. So we did talk selection on ng-conf on Saturday. It was by far our hardest one ever. 16 hours just to select the talks. We didn't even get to the workshops. That took a, a second day. This was the first time we've ever taken a second day to do talk selection early. And uh, we we literally went from 8 a.m. until 12.30 a.m. with one hour break for like dinner. That was it. Other than that, it was yeah. 100% straight. Yeah. Brutal, but fun. And thanks to Alyssa and Lucas Rubelke and Owen, um, what's Owen's last name? Owen Meekum. Owen Meekum mm-hmm. for coming and helping out. So excited for, so like really my pick is just ng-conf, right? The talks are out. You should easily be able to go and find the speaker list, grab your tickets. It's time to Yeah, go. it looks like Manfred and Maxime have it mentioned in their abstracts. Awesome. So there we go. So that's my first pick. My second pick is along the line of things to learn. If you want to have your uh, brain stretched, obviously Elm is a really a big stretch if you're doing frameworks. But another one that I think is super cool to just check out just to learn and expand your mind a little bit is Svelte because Svelte has zero run, downloadable runtime. When it's done transpiling, it's just JavaScript directions to the browser and there's no, it has no overhead for you know, it's runtime that comes down to the browser with you. So uh, incredibly small package size, just a unique outlook uh, on how to do front-end frameworks. And then my third pick is uh, going to be the one I am really the most excited about, which is my big announcement that I have taken over as CEO of Thinkster.io. And that's going to be how I'm spending my time for the next five plus year, my life for the next five plus years. And really... I've really been building up to this for like six years since I started getting full-time into programmer education, which was trying to do, looking at what the state was and trying to do it better and different. And so I'm crazy excited because I'm going to take this existing company that's in a reasonable spot and be able, but still small enough that it can pivot. And we're going to really change how online developer courses are built and do things that nobody has ever seen before and no company right now is doing to make online developer education a lot more effective Yay. Uh, than it is right now. And so it makes, I'm, I'm just crazy excited to, to get that started. Been going nonstop at it. We've really been working on, on this for like a year already just to complete the transition and take over the company, uh, taking it over from Eric and Albert, uh, who run StackBlitz and invented StackBlitz. They actually started it. So that's my other pick is kind Will of... Will they still be on the team with you? Very, 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 very lightly. Eric will be doing like a stri- st- helping me with strategy a little bit. And then Albert, who was did probably a little bit more of the coding than Eric, will help a little bit with some of the like transition, but very, very light. So I just sent the link of Thinkster to my husband and he messaged me back, uh, where's Ember? <laughs> <laughs> um, Walls. <laughs> one, thing to note, one thing to note is we are going to have some really tight integrations with StackBlitz. So we're going to see a lot of pretty cool oh, stuff coming exciting. out that's a joint between Thinkster and StackBlitz to just make it a better experience to be really, truly coding and learning and not just watching, you know, or trying to type along. So that's it. Those are my picks. All right, I'll go next. I have a pick. Um, it's uh, the other day, Maxime Koretsky, he blogged, it's called Connecting the Dots. And uh, it's really kind of insanely long. 
Like I think I me- told him to cut I it think down. Medium said it was a fourteen hour read or something like that. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? No. You're joking, right? No, it says thirty five minute read. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> it's a long read, but I couldn't stop reading once I started. Uh, it talks about how this guy had aspirations, and then he just kind of walks you through everything he did and. Everything was so with a purpose and it was so done like intentionally. And I was just kind of blown away at the, uh, the message from Maxime. So without getting a spoiler, can we have like a, what it's oh, about? Yeah, like, so he, <laughs> like he wanted to um, start build his reputation. So he started on stack overflow and his first goal was um, I want, I want a score of 10,000 points on stack overflow. That was like his first goal. And, and then he had, he throws up this quote, and it's I, I was laughing because it's so gr- such a great quote. The shit it's underused, and it's from Forrest Gump, where he's like, "I figured I might run to the end of town, and when I got there, I figured I might as well keep on going, and when I got there, I might as well run across the entire state of Alabama." And, and you know, and it's that quote from Forrest Gump, and, and he talks about once I got to ten thousand, I figured why not go to or why not go to twenty five thousand, and like he just kind of keeps talking about. And then he did this, and then he did this, and then he he used Stack Overflow to grow his blog, and then his blog he used it to grow Stack Overflow. And I was just like, wow, this he, everything was done so intentionally and like well thought out. I was kind of blown away at how how much insight he had when he started, and so yeah, really inspiring for anyone looking to get get their name out there a little more. Um, I would go check out Connecting the Dots on Angular in Depth. That's his blog, so check it out. Uh, Ward, you got some picks, bro? Being as thoroughly prepared for this as I was, uh, I am reviving my pick on sharpening a pencil. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's my pick. You got to learn how Lord to sharpen a pencil help us. properly. <laughs> <laughs> Skeptics, every one of you. But, uh, you know, you could do that or you could waste your time with Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez such a compelling argument ward so compelling. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just i'm just throwing it down dropping the mic hey ward i want to tell you a little tiny story okay this because you will resonate this will resonate with you before we move on to the cool picks from uh, i'm already Aaron. quivering i'm already quivering so i my son i went to the school event some guy was there he's talking he writes for starwars.com and uh, a bunch of other stuff he's his son is named Anakin. He's this huge Star Wars uh, fan, and he he's made a whole career out of it, right? So he's talking he to all these kids. A kid after a Star Wars. Ca- hey, I have argued for shame. naming Lord. my child Anakin. So oh no Lord. way! Why and and it still Darth? says is that Darth. Still says no, but or, or, or Darth. I'm gonna do Star. <laughs> or do you not know what my son's n- name is? No, I don't. His name is Ryan Anakin Eames. Okay. You can name him Anakin because the movies weren't out yet, were they? Oh, were they? Let's yeah. See. Yeah, they were out. They're, They're older than Joe himself. Yeah. yeah. They were out. <laughs> oh, Annie. I just oh, got Annie. a Slack message. Let it go, woman. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, getting back to the story. <laughs> like the longest top pick section ever. Uh, this guy's talking, and one of these kids, you know, it's a, it's a range of kids from something like, I'd say, eight all the way up to like 14 it is a middle school and, and elementary combined. One of the kids in this raises his hand and the guy is, you know, he's like taking questions. So he's, he looks at the kid and says, yes. And he says, will you please stop talking about Star Wars? It sounds like a lecture. <laughs> a teacher had to remove the kid from the room and bring him back to apologize uh, afterwards. But it was. Oh, I'm sure they sent the kid to the principal because it's against the, you know. I wanted to ask if his last name was Bell. Right, like, <laughs> <laughs> wanted to see if there was, you know, some relation going on here. Clearly a child whose future is bright. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Aaron, was that all of yours? I know you... It's all mine. I just had the one. Okay. So what do you got for us, Ben? One that I just happened to come across yesterday in, in the learning of you. I've been watching Egghead IO. And unfortunately, I, I might be like many people here where I've actually been a subscriber of Egghead IO for like 18 months. I've watched, you know, a video every three months or something, but I'm committing to try and learning more about it. But anyway, I was watching a Neghead course on View by John Lindquist, and he, in his code, he had this link to this thing called Micro Icon. It's this SVG icon placeholder microservice, icon.now.sh. And it's just, I think, a really well curated collection of icons that are SVG that you can either hot link directly, like with image tags, or you could view the source and download the SVGs and create your own SVG sprites. And 
it, it only hit me because I have many times wanted to start incorporating more SVG into my Angular app and felt like I didn't know where to find those things. And the ones that I did find just never really looked right. These just look very application oriented. So I'm excited about that. Also kind of along the, learn, the lines of learning this year, uh, I've, I've recently become a huge fan of Netlify, which I've, I've probably picked on here at some point. Um, it's a free tier. It's a freemium model where you can essentially deploy static applications directly from your GitHub branches and it has a build steps and it'll, you know, you can do things like copy your build files into public folders and it's all behind a CDN and it's super, super easy. And I feel like it will unlock for me the ability to tinker with a particular framework and then deploy it to an actual domain name. And suddenly I have a site, you know, I can power with something like Firebase and, and really do that kind of a Jamstack style uh, development this year. And then um, let's see, uh, non, non-tech picks quickly. Uh, I just finished season two of The Marvelous Miss Maisel, which is probably one of the best TV shows I've seen in a long time. Just hilarious. It's part of Amazon Prime. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, it's about a female comedian from, I think, the 50s, a fictional character, but just just absolutely a delightful show. And uh, two podcasts that I've become fans of lately, uh, Freakonomics and Hidden Brain. And they're both sort of about uh, human behavior and how it affects the, the world at large and the world around us. That's it. Great stuff, Ben. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for stirring the pot. Indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. This has been an absolute pleasure. I miss, uh, I miss seeing you guys. And other than your blog, how else can people find you online? I have uh, at Ben Nadell for Twitter, which is mostly where I publicize the things I write about on my blog uh, and pictures of my dog, which is basically the other half of the day I spend uh, communicating. And um, yeah, and my blog at bennadell.com. Very nice. Cool. That's it for the show today. Thanks for coming, Ben. You've been an ev- excellent guest. And uh, we'll see you back here sometime in the future, yeah? Looking forward to it, of course. All right. Thanks, awesome. guys. Ciao. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.